I'm Lawrence Cohn, the director of the Center for South Asia Studies at Berkeley, and welcome to Collecting South Asia, Archiving South Asia Conference on South Asian Art. Um, the first panel today uh, is called Introduction to the Conference Methodological Predicaments. And as time is short, um, uh, uh, instead of asking Shugato to introduce the panel, I'm going to introduce the first speaker because it's me. Um, and then he's going to come and introduce uh, our wonderful second speaker. Uh, I'm a bit cautious because um, uh, I'm not sure if I can offer you methodological predicaments, but let me say something which is tied to my uh, current research. Um, this, uh, these comments are called the Federation of Silos. Shigato asked, well, I'm Lawrence Cohn, the director, and I'm in the Departments of Anthropology and South and Southeast Asian Studies. Um, I'm a medical anthropologist by training, and that will be obvious in this talk. Um, Shigato asked if I might address the possible relation of my own work to the themes of collecting and the archive. As my time is quite brief, let me lay out a few thoughts on the circulating promise and threat of the collection of biometric data and on the projected form of its archive. These thoughts are indebted to many fellow scholars, among whom I would single out a fantastic research assistant, Pablo Seward. My comments are divided into two parts, collecting India and archiving India. Collecting India. <coughs> two frames orient contemporary efforts to collect traces of human biotic form at the national level in India. Over the 1990s, biometrics emerged as a category of the collectible within a charismatic technological imaginary no longer closely bound to the forensic assemblage of fingerprints and other presumptively telltale surfaces, apertures, and organs materialized under the penal code. It was followed by a similarly charismatic figure of big data as the imaginary of the new archive. The first framing for biometrics was that of security, and its human object was the terrorist. The Cargill conflict between India and Pakistan propelled a renewed sense of the border's haptic intimacy a sense intensified with the multilinguistic spread of 24-7 news cycles and the global security regime instantiated in late 2001 worldwide. And an Indian parliamentary commission proposed the collection of the biometric data, it wasn't quite clear at that point what this data would be, uh, of Kashmiris in particular and other border populations in general. Concurrent proposals focused on collecting the biometrics of coastal populations in the wake of the serial bombings of Mumbai. Over the first years of the 21st century, these proliferating regional projects from about 2000 to 2005 were either replaced or supplanted by a conception of a common multi-purpose national identity card, the MNIC, um, on the table by 2003. The MNIC added a second foreign object to that of the terrorist, that of the illegal migrant, usually from Bangladesh. The collection process was somehow to differentiate between citizens and non-citizens. A 2005 Department of Information and Technology document notes, quote, non-citizens should be issued identity cards of a different color and different design, unquote. At this point, that is, the identity card is the dominant site of exhibition for the proposed new collection, and the very purposes of still non-fully specified biometrics were limited to characterizing per person's proper relation to territory. The reach of the proposed collection was being extended from the borders to the nation as a whole, an extension that seemed to trouble the very feasibility of actual collecting across a range of anxious government reports of the time. How do we collect biometrics on a very large country? Amid this anxiety, the Home Ministry linked the MNIC, the multinational I'm sorry, the uh, multi-purpose uh, card, to the national decennial census as a proven instrument of collection. The proposed collection is renamed the National Population Register, or NPR. It is worth pausing at this point in the story, for what is proposed in the NPR is the transformation of a primarily aggregate data form, the census, into an individualizing form. In other words, the population is being materialized in a potentially novel way. What Paul Rabineau termed Galton's regret, that is the 19th century failure of fingerprints to materialize the race for the purposes of eugenic governance, is here redeployed within an aggregate technology linking the individual biotic trace to territorialized information 
constituting the social form of the national citizenry. The collective subject of information is no longer a primarily or solely statistical form, the census up until 2011. What we might turn the social as informational aggregate, a unity critical to the imaginary of the planning state, but rather is to be a collection of territorialized biographical information and, and embodied biological traces. What we might turn the social as biotic territorial assemblage, constitu constitutive of national security. Of note, when the NPR was rolled out in 2001, this was the same census collection in which after decades caste data was again being captured. A different order of specificity, but one similarly tracing a presumptively biological condition impelling the data form. Even at this point, midway through the decade, as plans were being assembled to roll up the NPR for 2011 for the census, biometrics were being deployed otherwise by a range of state humanitarian and corporate actors to produce a new condition of virtual governance. Biometrics here entail the digital recording and collection of fingerprints for the most part, associating these with a number and these biometrics finger two types of population, neither primarily organized on the basis of territory, but rather in the first case on the basis of labor and the second on the basis of social marginality. Thus, as institutions like the Indian Institutes of Technology or more accessible, low-level training programs, companies like Infosys and recruitment agencies like the infamous Body Shops together produced a powerful new collection of technically trained, relatively cheap IT labor for the global market, the demands of labor surveillance and governance intensified. Indian marker regulatory bodies established the National Skills Registry I'm sorry for the acronyms, this is the NSR, for IT professionals based on digital fingerprint collection promising better credentialization uh, and data security for transnational employers. The same imperatives for producing a different order of credential circulated similarly across debates over the administration and auditing of state and NGO welfare programs. And this is in a decade when new foundations like the Gates Foundation began to insist upon a new order of audit uh, for the organization of international welfare programs. Um, um, uh, Ravi Sundaram has argued that by the end of the decade of the 2000s, urban slum dwellers were giving the finger to a range of biometric collections, each tied to a given state scheme, credit organization, or foreign funder, and each producing its own smart card. Again, I want to point out the presence of the card as the exhibition site of the new collection. These multiple collections came to constitute the second frame, that is, for the collection of biometric form in general. Here, not border security, but rather the administration of labor and of welfare. And just as the scale of proposed collection advances towards the national in the case of the security frame, so the multiple smart cards and biometric credentializations of the 2000s are supplanted by an emerging scale of the national biometric regulation of welfare by decade's end. The idea of a common platform for all of these demands of welfare and labor regulation was circulating across a range of agencies by 2005. The version of the common platform that was adopted by the central government of India was that of the founder and CEO of Infosys, a central player in the regulation of labor at this point, the founder being Nandan uh, Nilekani. By 2008, the project of national ID was handed over to Nilekani for the formation of the unique ID authority of India and his installation as director. Nilekani's team branded the new data form Adhar, Hindi for basis or foundation, as in the sense of the desired common platform. Adhar's governance was from the outset exceptional. The authority was unlike NPR, not located under the Home Ministry or the Census, and the Lekhani reported directly to the Prime Minister. Collection was not dependent, unlike the Census, upon a state apparatus, but depended rather on market incentives through its outsourcing to a range of private, but also state and non-governmental agencies who would collect the actual biometrics. The model of a large-scale public-private partnership had become a powerful sign in sight by this time of anti-corruption as a recognizable new mode of governance, as in the successful creation of the Delhi Metro and the less successful history of the Commonwealth Games. The Metro's success lay in its exceptional relation to established bureaucracy 
and an heroic conception of service linked to the ability and charisma of its director. The same model was assumed by Nilekani in creating a national ID. Nilekani's version of the national biometrics was distinguished from NPR in at least four significant ways. First, of course, its target was not primarily border security, but the creation of a credentialized, anti-corrupt form of welfare and labor. Second, its rationality was not organized around biography and territory, or the discrimination between citizens and non-citizens. In a sense, the less, uh, in a sense, the less information uh, Adar as a data form contained, the better against left critics who attacked the new program as an insidious violation of privacy. Nalikani could point out that Adhar collected almost no information besides name, gender, current residence, and date or year of birth, linking these to the digital trace of 10 fingerprints and two irises to a face photo and to a random number. It was deterritorialized. Third, uh, in terms of the difference from NPR, the rationale of Adhar's effectiveness in the social lay in the very technique of its um, uh, effectiveness as a collection, that is, in its deduplication. Deduplication is a basic set of technical procedures for maintaining a data collection and preventing duplicates from cropping up. India, Nilekani could promise, would itself be deduplicated through Adhar. Corruption analyzed as a problem of, duplicated, of duplicates, proliferating and diverting funds, could be now controlled. India could become more like China if it did not waste its common wheel in duplication. Uh, and Nilekani talks again and again about why we must be more like China and how to achieve this. This juxtaposition, the question of China's entry into world history, is reminiscent of the Hegel of the philosophy of history and the aesthetics, particularly the latter where India as the site of the idea unencumbered by the world could only produce duplicates of the idea, a form of criticism that has haunted, at least through Stella Cramrich, the history of classical Indian art, with analyses of temple form, for example, as monstrous or unoriginal in their tendency towards duplicative proliferation of form. The project of deduplicating India through Adhar was, of course, always haunted by the problem that Adhar was the second version of a national identity, duplicating the census-based NPR. That is the very effort to produce a radical deduplication of India, bring it into history, breed China, end poverty, and create mass efficiency was itself always already duplicated by the first version of national ID organized around border security. There were two national ID cards through the 2000s. Although beyond the scope of my comments today, uh, how the relation between the two national projects has unfolded has become a problem for the governance of both as the bureaucrats behind NPR had not gone away. And fourth, the difference. As a condition of effective deduplication, the government of identity could not be based on any easily duplicated technology or material, like paper or even plastic. Nilekani and his team pointed out again and again that Adhar, as a collection, uh, could not be a card, but only a number. This ontological condition of collection presented what we might term a problem of exhibition. To get people to register for the collection of their biometrics, a vast publicity machine showed successful regist registrants clutching the piece of paper that was mailed to them as their receipt of the transaction, of their successful inclusion, of the proof of a new identity. Looking just like a card, this non-card was not the exhibition site of the new collection. If it was a ticket to a promised new future, a biometric inclusion to welfare and work, its relation to what I am terming exhibition here was a constant question. Archiving India. Where was the collection housed and how was it exhibited? I have time here for only a few final comments. Critics of Adar focus on what they term its convergence. That is, if, properly, if formerly data was archived in separate repositories termed silos, given that they were conceived as being vertical as they lacked horizontal links between them, Adhar promised or threatened to link these silos. Such linkages were part of its critical necessity, for example, to medical anthropologist and World Bank President Jim Kim, enabling India to improve its disastrous record of tuberculosis management. The problem of TB, as Veena Das and many others have argued, is that a range of incentives keeps the information of different clinics isolated and keeps persons moving between many clinics. The technocratic solution proposed by Adhar is to treat each clinic as a data silo. WHO has argued, drawing on Adhar, that India 
In India, persons with TB are cases and never patients, and only a horizontal linkage of silos could turn a case into a patient. Adhar promises this link. If TB medication were to be linked to biometrics, then every time a person was diagnosed, his or her entire history would be available to rationalize proper care. Such linkage terrifies many on the left, particularly if India follows South Africa and Brazil and moves towards welfare governance through direct cash transfers, something Adhar in the form of financial inclusion it is producing could make possible. The concern is apt, though it is worth noting that many on the South African left find the attitude of the Indian left both mystifying and indeed, as they argue, rather elitist. Nilekani argues that Adhar will not produce conversions, but rather what he terms a federation of data. The idea of a federated archive is this. Every government agency, every school, every bank, and every company that wants to identify its customer to ensure she or he is not a duplicate scans the person's finger or eye. This information is relayed to the black box of Adhar's secure database, and all that is returned is a yes or a no. In other words, agencies cannot siphon each other's silo data through Adhar as a common pathway. Silos are brought together but retain their distinctiveness. Thus, this is a new federation each able to trust the other through the yes or no of Adhar. In practice, however, even the example of the horizontally linked TB clinic suggests that Adhar does enable some data convergence that cannot be only what is called here a federation. Over the past three years, the proponents of the census link NPR have used elite anxiety around Adhar to gain the upper hand and to force the two duplicated national data archives to be combined. Nalekini has been able to resist the combination of archive, his black box remains secure, but not of his system of privatized collecting. What has emerged is a condition of sustained confusion as to the relation between two collections. My current work examines the range of sites where each is being deployed and is turning towards exhibition. Uh, it's drawing on, on a figure to begin to, under, to, to wrestle with a, shifty, a quickly changing curatorial landscape. Thank you.